Issues solved just by going to the burner approach. Fission product removal, we don't have any need for on-site processing. We may choose to process the salt once we're finished it, but like I say, that's a nation's choice. Tritium control, um, we're not giving up on enriched lithium or beryllium, but with the when you're not a breeder, not trying to save every last neutron, we have the ability to use non-flied carrier salts that really knock down the tritium production by about 99%. Um, Reactivity coefficients, the burner designs just, in, it's, it's really between uranium-233 and plutonium and, and uranium-235, just far superior reactivity coefficients. Uh, Off-gas management, we don't have to pull the gases out really, really quickly what, like you want to do with a bur uh, breeder design, uh, but it just gives us more options, which again, I won't go into too many details, highly enriched uranium use, we're not using that. Every, the uranium is always denatured. Any PU present really quickly builds up to a lot of 240 and a lot of 242. Both those make it virtually, if not literally, impossible to use in weapons. The remaining challenge, I I'd say, are really materials related. Uh, noble metals tend to plate out in heat exchangers. We always knew you're, you're not going to talk about going in and fixing a heat exchanger. If you have a problem, you're replacing the entire tube bundle. Um, a little tricky if they dry out, if there's a heat source there. Long-term corrosion and radiation damage of the metals we use, high nickel alloys, has to low end, even some stainless steels perform superbly, but proving a 30 to 60 year lifetime is gonna be a challenge to the regulator, to the investor, et cetera. Graphite replacement, it gives you very strong advantages, but its lifetime is limited by the power density. Uh, and if you want to change it. So this led to a very long, for decades with Oak Ridge, this seal or swap. So you have a limited lifetime if you use it at a high power density. Uh, so do you seal the reactor for the lifetime with a low power density, or do you go to a more economically viable high power density and then plan to replace graphite? So early work, yeah, let's make them smaller and just re we'll just replace the graphite every four years but that is far more difficult than many might imagine. Uh, later work at Oak Ridge said, no, let's go to low power density, very large cores, but then higher capital costs, there's more fuel, more fuel salt, uh, bigger building, all that. Uh, so what is our inter integral molten salt reactor? As you would have guessed, of course, it is a, the idea is a burner design, a lot like the 1980s DMSR. We want to integrate our primary systems into a sealed reactor vessel. Uh, planned in a variety of sizes from 80 megawatts thermal up to 600 megawatts thermal using off-the-shelf steam turbine technology. Uh, maybe in the future it'll be CO2 or helium, but we feel initially it's steam. Uh, small modular factory fabrication is allowed. We have the ability to look at alternate salts and new off-gas systems. Uh, and a new passive decay removal, we prefer in situ, not really going with dump tanks. Um, um, we won't really get into it, except I'll just show you what we're up to. Uh, and thorium use, we have not yet decided. We haven't ruled it out or ruled it in. There's actually a remarkably long list of pros and cons, whether we use thorium. And in a burner design, it's really thorium is just replacing uranium-238 as a better fertile. Uh, so we'll either use it and use more 19.9 uh, or 10% enriched uranium. Um, or if we don't use thorium, then we go to really low enrichments in the, in the fuel. We have what we call a seal and swap approach. So the many technical challenges are addressed in our technology. Simply stated, our primary vessel is meant to be a perfect, permanently sealed system. Of course, pipes going in and out for uh, coolant salt, et cetera, with an economically high power density, much, much less than a 30 year lifetime. So after a seven year design life, an identical MSR, IMSR core unit, replaces the old unit for an indefinitely long uh, plant lifetime. Uh, we build in redundancy on our heat exchangers, so if we have a failure of one, we can continue with the remaining, uh, and to continue its quite limited lifetime of seven tiers. So basically sealed for lice plus replaceable is what we're talking about. So the core unit, uh, I won't get into too much details, and quite obviously we're, we're, we're not always showing every last little bit or maybe even uh, 
misdirecting in a sense. Uh, I also tend to call this the 2014 version. We, we had a deliverable of a preconceptual design report. Uh, we had to make the most conservative choices we can. We are now into a stage, uh, our second phase of development, where we can make some changes. So there has been changes, which of course I won't tell you about. Uh, but the, the basic idea is graphite in the bottom of the reactor vessel. These sort of orange wedges, six of them, three shown, are the heat exchangers, each separately. And each heat exchanger has a pump motor. You can't see the impeller, but it would be just inside there. Very simple impellers because it's very low pressure drops, very uh, low power. That's only 10 kilowatt pump for the smallest unit. Uh, each has its own inlet and outlet for secondary coolant salt. So a secondary coolant salt is taking the heat away from the reactor, but the fuel salt, everything radioactive is staying in there. Off gas, we have a lot of options, which I won't get into. But fuel salts push through the heat exchangers, down through the annulus, up through the core, up through a chimney, and then repeats that cycle. And up in here, that's a big gas plenum space, so we can uh, pressure changes, uh, volume changes as we feed in more fuel, et cetera. Uh, we're showing a uh, flow-driven uh, shutdown rod. If the pump stops, that rod will drop by gravity and an independent secondary shutdown system of a uh, neutron absorber injection, which is thermally based. That goes within sort of the next layer of containment. We have what we call a buffer salt liner, which I'll talk more about, but this is a big, thick, roughly about a meter thick of just pure, simple salts, fluoride salts. Uh, a nice cap here that we can remove to exchange the unit. Showing the next level, then we start to get into like thick concrete, nuclear grade concrete for all kinds of, to make sure you drop down radiation levels to next to nothing. Um, big steel plates that are not shown that can be removed when we have to remove this replaceable core unit. Uh, the facility itself uh, could be of course multi-unit plants. We typically always show two silos though, these are identical. So the, the operation principle is the first unit arrives, by this, the smallest unit can likely, uh, we're kind of pushing weight restrictions, but the smallest unit can be completely fabri factory fabricated. The larger units just by weight issues might have to come in pieces where we put them together in here. Um, the first unit is installed and that will run for seven years with this other silo just empty. When that seven year period is up, or just before, the second unit can come in, which is installed into the second silo. So when we shut down that first unit, we don't have to do anything with it quickly. We have a full seven years for it to die down the radiation levels. We don't want to touch it for a while. The fuel salt, it's liquid. It can be taken out at any time. Um, but we have seven years while the second unit operates. Then just before the third unit, that's when we can drain all the fuel salt, lift it out and out, and out to long-term storage silos. And it's, it's quite low levels of radiation by then. Sort of a bit of a peer comparison, other small modular reactors. This is not apples to apples comparison, uh, but just kind of shows the, the, the size of units that need to be shipped. This is meant to be our largest unit, 3.6 3 meters wide, roughly about 12 meters tall. Uh, compared to the new scale, their 50 megawatt electrical unit or 160 megawatts thermal. Uh, M power, unfortunately, isn't really, it's been on the shelf. By the end, they were at a bit of a higher power level, but it, it just kind of shows a comparison of size. This shows between our different core unit sizes down to the 80 megawatt thermal. And this is with the most conservative choices, the most conservative heat exchangers. Uh, so in the future, these, these sizes can be uh, improved or reduced. A bit of a comparison with a, a small light water reactor, the AP600, that hasn't been built and they went right to the larger, but, and with our largest unit, so it, it's more power, the AP600, but just showing like you almost need magnifying glasses for the, a lot of the components, whereas the 70 foot tall steam generators and everything, uh, foot thick steel, et cetera, gives you an idea. The other, the other thing as well that light water reactors can do is they have big, wet steam turbines, uh, High, the, the steam conditions we're looking at are identical to coal-fired plants, so either superheat or supercritical steam, uh, very compact units. But challenges solved with the IMSR, that seal for life offers enormous regulatory advantages to accelerate development. The spent vessel is now, it's repurposed to be a, a storage of the mildly radioactive graphite. Uh, we don't have to worry about airborne release if we're looking at swapping graphite or, or heat exchangers, et cetera. We have a long cool down time before moving. 
uh, material lifetime and corrosion, we, anything that's touching those radioactive salts, we really only have to prove a seven year lifetime. And we, it allows evolution of design with ease and maybe not as obvious, as obvious but there's a razor blade analogy here uh, to attract potential business partners. They know that it's not just how many reactors you build, but if we build these, there's business for decades and decades on uh, replacement core units. Uh, very quickly on our concepts of decay removal, uh, and again, in the future things may be slightly different, but that bu buffer salt is meant to be a solid during normal operation, which, which is also a good insulator. Any solid can be. So out by the time you're getting out to concrete, that has really shielded amount of heat that's transferred. But if we lose all pumps, this salt is chosen to be at a melting point just a little higher than normal operation. So if all the pumps stop, and of course you'd always have natural circulation to steam, but if we assume there's absolutely no other heat removal, then the buffer salt starts to melt. That draws heat away from the reactor. And of course, if the salt is the coldest on the outer edge of the reactor, and hottest inside, that's going to set up natural circulation. And we get a couple days in the smallest unit before all the salt, or almost all the buffer salt is melted. And then a water jacket uh, that's protecting the concrete from get, ever getting too hot, that can take over sort of the heavy lifting for very long term. And there's a lot of reasons you can look at radiant heat straight up. These are completely walk away safe. But there's a lot of engineering work to prove that to the regulatory body satisfaction. So the bottom line, we deliver hot, clean salt. That can be used directly for process heat. We can add a steam generator for process steam. And the most, well, obvious use is adding a turbine generator for power. Uh, it, we feel it's the simple approach, easiest to achieve regulatory license and public acceptance. Cost innovation is the end result. The fuel costs are almost trivial, less than a couple tenths a kilowatt hour. That's including enrichment, everything. Our early cost estimate work was at $2 a watt electrical or 60 cents a watt thermal for the largest unit. Uh, for the smallest unit about, um, at about 32 and a half megawatts electrical, about $5 a watt. Economies of scale when you try to shrink them. Our Canadian government would love us to go even smaller, but we kind of resist going any smaller. So our phase one, we've had detailed cost engineering work has added to confidence. Our phase two work will expand this enormously. Uh, so de design simplicity is the key. But of course, much work ahead, pump development, salt selection and validation, heat exchanger design, the, the nitty gritty of things, valve and disconnect systems, steam generation. Um, all quite solvable issues, but it's just some good old fashioned engineering to do. Quickly, a bit of a business update. So we were founded in January 2013, but most of us has been involved for this many years be before that. Um, I met Simon Irish at one of these conferences, I forget if it was the second or third, uh, but this really brings people together. So the directors of our company and myself as Chief Technology Officer, I'm not sure if Simon has arrived yet, he'll be here sometime today. Simon Irish, our CEO, has been very, very uh, excellently guiding our corporate ship through sometimes, of course, shark infested waters, uh, doing an excellent job. Ken and Brian, our, our CFO, which I think is here somewhere in the room, uh, or if not, wheeling and dealing out in the hallways. Um, Hugh McDermott, uh, is chair of our board, and Dave Hill, one, uh, a fifth director. I'll mention those fellows more. Uh, we are, of course, building proprietary molten salt reactor technology. We hope to have the first commercial unit, demonstration unit in one uh, early next decade. Our team consists of over 28 directors, employees, consultants, and advisors. Uh, I mentioned some of the main sort of management team, Paul McIntosh, who is Oh, Paul, Paul's here in the room, Rob Bodner, Cyril Roddenberg, Mike Edwards, I'll mention him again later, Brian Mercer, Chris Popoff, the main team, but we're rapidly expanding. Uh, we've completed phase one, all our seed financing, our deliverables of the preconceptual design, formed our management team, formed the company to grow into the larger company that we are now becoming. Uh, quickly on milestones, I won't read off some early milestones. Uh, Dave Hill was... Uh, senior executive management positions of both Argonne, Oak Ridge, and uh, Idaho National Lab on our board. Hugh McDermott, former uh, CEO and president of, of Atomic Energy of Canada, uh, very early adopter, so to speak, has been incredibly helpful for us and very, very involved. Uh, completed our seed financing, uh, piled patent in 59 countries, completed the preconceptual design report in all its glory uh, in, in the fall, public launch in September, uh, entered agreements with Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, that's up in Canada. Initial collaborations with Oak Ridge that are uh, first stages are complete, We're we want to do more. 
um, and University of Tennessee. Uh, very lately, thing, this, uh, this isn't very update, but Jeff Merrifield, former NRC commissioner, Mike, Mike Edwards, on our advisory board, but transitioning to a, being a full-time employee. I'm not sure if that's official yet or not. If it is, it's only been a day or two. Uh, former, the senior design engineer of the Empower at Babcock & Wilcox. He's been enormously helpful uh, to date. Uh, Paul Blanchard, James Reinch, formal, former CEO of Bechtel Nuclear, joined the advisory board. And um, let, let's just say, stay tuned for details. If this was a few weeks from now, I'd have a lot more interesting uh, things to announce, potentially, but I can't really say about them. Uh, but that ties into what, we, what I consider our biggest surprise. Uh, things have been going quite well, but I think our biggest surprise is our reception within the existing nuclear community. We kind of expected indifference from light water folks or fast breeders. Uh, that has not been the case. Uh, this is, well, blatant self-promotion here, but a good example of that is Nuclear News, the American Nuclear Society publication. They chose the 10 uh, advanced reactors in the world, uh, of course with a US or North American bias, but were chosen as one of those. And that was only about two months after we, in a sense, came out publicly. Um, and like I say, just a lot of people are coming to us and that's been, it's been an amazing experience to, uh, to go through. Uh, so a phase two development in this year and next year into early 2017, we're expanding our team, uh, more strategic technical partners. Uh, again, like I say, if it was a few weeks, we'd probably have more announcements we could make. More national lab work in North America and Europe. Um, goal in this second phase is, is to really complete three files that will help us secure the major funding to actually get the reactor built. So the design specified to the conceptual design standard, ready to go then to the engineering blueprint stage. Licensing, we want to go through the first phase of the vendor design review within, in Canada by the end of this two-year period to finish it. That gives you a report card, initial report card. Uh, and economics really proving out we, there's a lot of money involved to proving these, these early cost estimates. Um, so just kind of ending up here, we feel this is a new paradigm for nuclear energy, a new uh, economic prop proposition of being cost competitive. We feel we will be extremely competitive with coal and even cheap current natural gas, scalable. Uh, it's a global energy resource to fo rival fossil fuels fuels, uh, accessible heat and electrical energy, secure, reliable, portable, grid-independent energy. These can, these can be built and established either as traditional grid units or in more remote users. And we feel it's a new social proposition as well, that passive safety, it's a completely different narrative to the con current nuclear safety. Nuclear power today is safe, but it has cost them a lot to be that safe, and it's a very hard message to, to get across to the public. Uh, but with new technology and with passive systems, that should be a much better narrative. For a smaller and more manageable waste pr pr footprint, the possibility of virtually no long-term nuclear waste. Um, the burners do not need to process during use. It's, it's probably going to be the case, and most users will choose to then reprocess, take all the plutonium and americium, put it in another fuel source, and it gives you an amazing long-term uh, waste profile and just exemplary proliferation resistance. Um, that's why the, the denature molten salt reactor was developed in the first place. I think that's about it. Let's give Dr. LeBlanc a hand. Thanks, Dave. Yep. Last week, Julie Bishop reignited the debate on Australia's nuclear future by saying nuclear power was an obvious direction to cut carbon emissions. This week, the Prime Minister supported the idea but warned the industry not to expect government funding. Despite containing almost half the world's uranium reserves, Australia is the only G20 country not to use nuclear power. And the debate this week has been as divisive as ever it were. Joining us to discuss are Ben Hurd, Director of uh, Think Climate Consultants Consulting in Adelaide, and Dr. Peter Karamoskos, a nuclear radiologist and representative of the government's Radiation Health Agency. Now, uh, Ben, you were someone who was originally opposed to nuclear power, but one, now you're one of its, of its uh, strongest advocates in Australia. Why do you believe that Australia needs nuclear? Australia has some of the dirtiest electricity in the whole world. We're probably one of the most coal dependent nations in the whole world for our, for our electricity mm -hmm. and globally the technology that's been most effective in displacing coal from electricity supplies is categorically nuclear electricity 
If we look at France, they uh, deployed 63 gigawatts, 63,000 megawatts of nuclear electricity in just 22 years, mm -hmm. and they have greenhouse gas emissions of about 90 grams per kilowatt hour, where we've got about 1,000 grams per kilowatt hour right. in Australia. Ontario, similarly, they've eliminated coal from their electricity supply. That's 13 and a half million people leading high energy lives using a mixture of nuclear electricity and renewables mm -hmm. with emissions that are around 70 grams per kilowatt hour. So the reason we need it is we know it works. There's evidence globally that we can have a developed nation, high energy lives and very clean air and very low greenhouse gas emissions. So Australia really needs to deploy nuclear along with renewables sure. to have that clean energy future. Uh, Peter, Ben puts forward a strong case and as we just heard, we're the only major economy not to have nuclear power. Uh, Julie Bishop this week says it's an obvious direction to go in. Why shouldn't we follow the world's lead on this? Uh, thank you for having me on your show. Look, what, what Ben says is half right. Um, the, half, the half that's right, I, don't, uh, that, uh, I agree with. The half that's wrong, I clearly don't agree with. Um, bottom line is most carbon emissions do not occur from electricity generation. If you look at the uh, IPCC report of 2014, um, only about 18% of carbon emissions due to electricity generation. They have a category called electricity and heating, and that accounts for 25%. 35% is due to transport and industrial activity, and you've got another 24% due to agriculture, forestry and other land uses. Uh, so, it, sorry, Ben, just to interrupt there. In Australia, electricity generation accounts for about 36% of all emissions. In a, sorry, Ben or Peter? Uh, so, sorry, Peter. Um, in Australia, um, coal uh, accounts for 85% of electrici electricity generation, mm -hmm. but it only accounts for 37% of carbon emissions. Right. Therefore, most carbon emissions in Australia, even in a carbon intensive electricity generating nation, are not due to electricity generation. That's the key point. But, but electricity power... generation is the single biggest source of no, carbon. Well, no, according it's not. to the government's own statistics, it is. No, in a, the in IPCC report, the IPCC report, the international experts on, on climate change, state that only uh, between 18 and 25 per cent electricity, electricity heating, uh, accounts, uh, um, uh, accounts for carbon emissions. Most carbon emissions are not due to electricity. But even, Andrew, even if, if, yeah. let's put that to one side for a second. The other claim is that uh, nuclear power does not emit greenhouse gases. It's clean and green, apparently. Mm -hmm. And that's just nonsense. It does. Most studies point out that it emits at about 66 grams uh, of CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour. That's twice what solar PV um, uh, is responsible for, right. and six times that of wind energy. And the other thing, the other, the other point is that um, it also, it also um, is quite highly damaging to the environment. I mean, you just have to, you just have to look at the consequences of uranium mining. You look at the, the, the impacts, uh, the <coughs> proliferation hazards that it involves, and also the fact that the waste is intractable. Sure. I mean, Australia can't even get rid of 5,000 cubic metres of waste that it's accumulated over right. 60 years. Yeah, so that As waste is a big concern. Yeah, uh, Ben, your response to that? I mean, we just heard oh, Peter make a big call that it's actually bad for the environment, and that's the whole point of this, this, this discussion. Yeah, I'm jumping off my chair to respond. Peter, nobody with any credibility in matters of climate change and energy would ever form an argument that electricity emissions are not a significant, crucial contributor to this problem. I didn't problem say that, that Ben. Don't, ver urgently. don't verbal me, Ben. I didn't say that. Peter, I said that it's not the major, major source of emissions. I'm yes, all for renewable. I'm that, all for Peter, renewable Peter, please, energy. Peter, you've just had a lot of time with the audience, and if I may respond, what you've done is form an argument against all forms of clean energy. Not the at all. The argument you've not put at all. forward not at all. is that. Peter, 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 can we, Peter, can we just let Ben respond. just to respond now? And sure. Ben, if you could just specifically respond to the notion that nuclear is um, uh, undesirable because you have so much waste to deal with and that it itself is a big emitter of, of carbon. OK. The University of Sydney looked at this issue specifically. There have been over 50 global studies to determine the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of nuclear energy. 
they reviewed all 50 studies and then did an original study for Australian conditions and had a best estimate life cycle emissions of 60 grams in Australian conditions, which was in the same range as wind at about 20 grams and superior to solar electricity Not at true, 110 ben. grams. Not about, true, well, I've read, well, I've read the report, Peter, and it's in a table. It's well, very, very clear. Ben Sovacool, University of Singapore. Um, Peter, Energy it, was a me, it was a meta review of 50 global studies and an original analysis done for Australian. So, so was Ben sorry, sorry, OK, so we, we acknowledge that between the two of you, there's a dispute about, you know, the greenhouse element of nuclear, 50 studies versus one. It's still a dispute. What about the waste? Sure. The well, a nuclear reactor will produce um, some uh, number of tonnes of spent nuclear fuel per cycle. So every two years it will eject some spent nuclear fuel measured in some number of tonnes, some very small number of tonnes. It's very compact, it's very easily and safely stored, and it's 100% recyclable in a fast reactor called a prism Absolute reactor. Absolute rubbish, or an ben, fast reactor. rubbish. All of that material can be accessed for new electricity in future. Now that is, has to be weighed against the pollution from coal because we can't just talk about the impacts of nuclear. We have to compare and measure our monsters against each other. When we burn coal in the, Latrobe, in the Loyang power station, we emit 19 million tonnes of CO2 every year and soot and sulphur dioxide and nitric oxide and mercury and other heavy metals and uranium radionuclides that come out of the coal as well, sure. all out of a chimney, straight mm. into our atmosphere for people to breathe. Mm. OK, mm. unfortunately we we're out of time. I'm nuclear. sorry, Ben, to have to interrupt you there. No, thank you. Um, we're, we're out of time. It's obviously a, a huge issue and, and a contentious one, um, and one that no doubt will continue. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks Good to be with me. you. Um, there is also, then, the other argument about the economic feasibility of it, given mm, that the government mm. said they will not give any money, give any money to it. There'll be no assistance. Um, and that our fossil fuels are keeping energy prices mm. you know, relatively low, so why are we motivated to change? Yeah, well, mm. yeah, it, because it's not dependable on wind or sun. That's yeah. a big plus for a lot of countries in the world.